Welcome back. These slides have so much stuff on them, I decided to turn the camera off this time. Uh, I'm not sure it adds anything anyway. I feel like I should start this session with a prayer. Our kind Father in heaven, we thank thee for the many blessings thou hast given us. We're thankful for the privilege of studying. We ask a special blessing at this time that thou would allow us to weather this storm in the world pour down light and knowledge upon those who are working on a cure for this disease and a way of mitigating its effects. Bless and inspire them and help us that we'll be able to get through this, us, we and our families, that we'll be able to serve thee and accomplish what we desire to do in our lives, especially bless the students as they study in this difficult way. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Okay. Let's review. Diatomic gases have to five degrees of freedom because, let you look at those, and it's B. One of the degree, rotational degrees of freedom is missing. It's the rotation axis that goes right through the middle of the tiny, tiny nuclei in the diatomic molecule, and that moment of inertia is so small that one quantum of rotation has an energy bigger than any of the molecules in the gas can give it. And so it just never gets activated. Planck and, Ra Planck and Einstein solved the black body radiation spectrum puzzle by guessing that, which of these? It's A. Light is made of particles, we call them photons, of energy h bar omega, or HF. The photoelectric effect shows that so the key step for being able to knock electrons out of a metal is to have light of high enough frequency that a photon can give the electron enough energy to get out of the metal where it's being held. It's frequency first, and then once you have enough frequency, as the intensity goes up, more and more electrons will come out because more and more photons are going in. In the Compton effect, what happens? And again, it's the particle behavior of light that makes the Compton effect work, although the frequency has to be pretty high. It has to be way out in the X-ray gamma region uh, for the light to actually change frequency when it scatters off an electron. Well, yeah, I know this is hard, so believe the formulas, figure out from the statement of the problem which formula is applicable make metal pictures as much as you can of what's going on, put numbers into the formulas and solve for the thing you don't know. The chapter summaries are shorter, but there are no worked examples in the chapter summaries. So when you really don't know how to do a homework problem, go to the book and look for an example, uh, a worked problem in there that's like the one you're trying to solve so you can see how these ideas are used. Okay, again, here's some questions from last time. Diatomic gases have five degrees of freedom because we live at a low temperature. At a very high temperature, there would be lots more degrees of freedom. True or false? That one's true. At high temperature, the vibration uh, degrees of freedom become activated. At incredibly high temperature, the other rotation one gets activated, but that would be such a high temperature that the atom would be completely destroyed by that anyway. All the electrons, many of the electrons would have been ripped out and it wouldn't hardly be an atom anymore. The energy of a photon is given by which of these formulas? Yeah, trick question. It's A and B. Both are equally valid. It just depends whether you want to talk about uh, the frequency F in Hertz or the frequency omega in radians per second. The momentum of a photon is given by, okay, same trick question. It's h bar k if you want to talk about wave number, and it's h over lambda if you want to talk about wavelength. 
In the photoelectric effect, electrons are knocked out of a metal by high frequency light. That's right. Okay. Chapter six, some more. If photons are both waves and particles, what about regular particles? Electrons, protons, and neutrons, and all the rest. Does something funny happen with them too? And the answer, as you read, uh, is yes. Something funny happens with them too. Here's a question, see if you can remember this one. To make high intensity red light, you need to have, okay, we're gonna keep the frequency the same at red. How do you get high intensity? And high intensity is simply lots of photons. Makes perfectly good sense. Okay, true or false? This is a pretty good mental picture of what a photon looks like. It's true, actually. Uh, it's got a red dot in it. That's the point photon that's detected on a screen but it also has a wave character to it. So there's a wave in there and they're combined somehow and we have no good mental picture of how that works. All we have are equations. But look, this is crazy. If we believe that light is made up of these little bullets, uh, how can two slits make a row of red interference dots on a wall like we saw in class? Bullets don't interfere. Well, we don't know the answer to this question but we have formulas that predict what happens. Somehow, each particle must go through the, both slits simultaneously because the interference pattern builds up whether we send the photons through many at a time or one at a time. And after decades of debating this question and trying to find uh, a mental picture that we think really makes sense, we've given up and we just believe the formulas and we use them to solve problems. Quantum mechanics is just plain weird. We, we can't imagine what happens in the microscopic world, I guess, because we just aren't small enough to live there. Maybe if we were beings who were the size of an atom, this would make sense. We would have experience with it, but it's completely mysterious to uh, us large molecule beings. True or false? This is a pretty good mental picture of what an electron looks like. And that one's also true. We think electrons look about like photons. <clears throat> 20 years after Einstein proposed that light was made of photon wave slash particles with energy, momentum, wavelength, and frequency all globbed together in a, a wavicle, a wave particle combination, Louis de Broglie proposed that electrons and protons and neutrons do this too. So, true or false, a moving electron has a wavelength. And that is true, actually. A moving electron has a frequency, true or false. That's also true. A stationary electron has a frequency. Yeah, that's also true. The equations of quantum mechanics are paired with the equations of relativity. And since a stationary electron has rest energy, mc squared, it has a frequency even when it's sitting still. The same formulas that we use for photons work for electrons, protons, and neutrons, but we use them kind of backwards. When we did photons, we knew light was a wave, so we knew that frequency and wavelength make sense. Then we had these formulas that told us that these, these photons also had energy and momentum. For the particles, electrons, protons, and neutrons, it's backwards. We know that they have energy and momentum. The surprise is that they have frequencies and wavelengths, but the formulas that relate them are the same. The photon formulas and the electron, proton, neutron formulas are the same. The only diff big difference is that the protons, the neutrons, and electrons have rest energy, mc squared, where the photon doesn't. Now, having said this, um, I got to tell you that we don't ever do anything with the frequency of a proton, a neutron, or an electron. 
these frequencies are so high, they're 10 to the 20 hertz for an electron and even bigger for protons and neutrons because their rest energy is higher. We don't have any way of doing experiments at that frequency. It's just unimaginably high frequency and we can't do it. We don't have any technology to do it and so we pretty much ignore it. We can't see effects due to the frequencies of these things, but we do see effects due to their wavelengths. For example, if you shoot an electron beam through a crystal, uh, you can get a pattern of electrons on the other side of the crystal that looks like this. It looks exactly like the pattern of dots of light that you get when you scatter photons off a crystal. You shoot electrons through a crystal, they do the exact same thing for the exact same reason. The electrons have a wavelength. And in some directions, they get constructive inter interference, and in other directions, they get destructive interference. This allows us to make spectacular images because with electrons, we can get wavelengths that are way smaller than the wavelengths of visible light. This is an electron microscope image of a flying insect, and the, the color is false because electrons don't come in colors. So we, it was shaded by the people who made the image uh, to contrast the different parts, but the parts are very much in focus because the electrons have such a short wavelength. Well, that brings up the question. Um, we make light images with lenses and mirrors. How do you make an electron lens? You'd have to bend the rays of electrons from an electron gun somehow to make these images. That's done with electric fields. Electric fields are used, and sometimes magnetic fields, are used to bend the electrons and focus them to make images. And in that sense, it's just like light. Then you read about something called the uncertainty principle. The uncertainty principle says what? Well, A is pretty tempting, but actually it's B. And C, there are two uncertainty principles, one for position and momentum, and another pair, particle pair and uncertainty relation, the energy and the time, and they're both important. You've already seen a version of the uncertainty principle. You saw it when we were playing with the double slits and single slits in class. We send the laser beam through the slits and we saw that when the slits got closer together or when the single slit got smaller, then the pattern on the wall got wider. That's an example of the uncertainty principle. One thing, if one thing gets small, another thing has to get big so that their product is either equal to something or maybe greater than or equal to something, but it can't be, it can't be smaller than something. We'll see some examples of that. So it gets wider. The uncertainty principle <clears throat> is actually not physics. It's pure mathematics. So I'm going to show you that now. I'm going to take a bunch of cosine waves in space, cosine kx. I'm going to add them all together, but they're going to have different k values. I'm going to let there be a, a k value in the middle, which has the highest amplitude cosine kx wave. And then on either side of it, I'm going to add in some other cosine kx waves with higher and lower k's and have the distribution of k values have a width to it. So it looks kind of like a hill. You'll see what that means in a minute. Mathematicians find using uh, the definition of the full width at half maximum, where you take a hill and go halfway up the hill and ask how wide the hill is, by that definition, the width of the k distribution and the width of the delta x distribution are somewhere around five or six. Or if you do it with time using omega and t, then the width of the spectrum in omega times the width of the wave packet that gets made by this distribution has to be about five or six. If the RMS width is used, then instead of five or six, the constant is uh, one half which is what's usually used in quantum mechanics. Okay, so here's what I'm actually talking about. I'm going, to take, I'm going to define the function f of x to be the sum of a bunch of cosine kx functions multiplied by an amplitude function, which is 
dependent on k. It's going to be big at the central k that I've chosen, and then it will decrease on either side. And then the question is, what kind of a function f of x is produced by adding up all these cosine waves? Well, here's the answer. Picture is worth a thousand words. So here's what it looks like. The width of the amplitude distribution in the upper frame is about 8. You can see that the half maximum line is drawn in with that black dotted line. And you can see it goes from about 16 to 24. So that's a width of 8. And it makes a little wave packet that looks like that blue thing down below, which is skinny. It has a width of about 1, or maybe even less, but around 1. I'm now going to tighten the red distribution A of K up. I'm going to make it narrower in the top frame and see what happens to the wave packet in the bottom frame. And here's what happens. If I tighten it up so that the width in K is about 1, the width in X becomes about 8. Well, 5 or 6. That's the uncertainty principle. It's a purely mathematical result. But once Louis de Broglie suggests that momentum and wavelength are linked together for particles by Planck's constant h-bar, then delta k would be delta p over h-bar. You can put that in the purely math result up at the top, and you get the physics results down at the bottom. Delta P delta X is bigger than or about H bar over 2 using RMS width, and the energy time relation is similar. So, how does the uncertainty principle become a physical idea instead of just mathematics? Well, you just saw this. Two answers. E is H bar omega, or P equals H bar K, turns those purely mathematical relations into physics. Now, so there's a little preview of what's coming up. <clears throat> I want to make it, make it clear after talking about this wavy stuff with wave packets that you understand what we're really talking about here. So if you were to look at the, take those fuzzy electron balls that you see, you remember you saw in your chemistry class and that you'll see when we get to chapter seven, eight, I think. Those fuzzy electron balls represent what? You may have to reach way back to your chemistry class. Those fuzzy balls are not actually a representation of the electron. They're a representation of where the electron is likely to be found, and they're actually standing wave patterns. Standing wave patterns of probability. They don't tell you where the electron is, they just tell you where you're likely to find it. So if you were to somehow detect an electron in an atomic orbital, maybe by scattering a photon from it, in the Compton effect, for example, the electron would, found to be, would be found to be a what? Or to found to be what? And the answer is B. Where we find electrons is kind of fuzzy and probabilistic. But whenever we find one, it's a single dot in space. It's a particle. The fact that it has frequency and wavelength didn't make it fuzzy somehow. It's still a dot. As near as we can tell, an electron really is a dot. It's a, it's a particle of zero size. And that's how it's always detected. Its fuzziness comes in uh, when we ask, well, where are we likely to find this thing? And that winds up being a fuzzy distribution. Answer me this one. In the double slit experiment with light, the photons, what? And the answer is the photons interfere each with its own self to create the pattern. They don't need another one to make the pattern. Each one all by itself can make the pattern. When a photon is detected on the charge couple device, the CCD and the, on the wafer in your camera, this photon is detected as a what? 
you read about this. It's a discrete point too. It's a little dot where the lump of light energy was deposited on the CCD. The photon itself is not fuzzy. It's a dot because it's a particle and a wave. So here's an example of this. This is a quantum photo. So this is a picture of a girl uh, taken with different numbers of photons. So in frame A in the upper left, that's with only 3,000 photons. That's what her image looks like with 3,000 photons. With 12,000 photons in frame B, you can kind of tell a little bit maybe what's in there. With 93,000 photons in C, it's becoming a little clearer. 760,000 photons in D make it look like a really bad old photo in somebody's album. 3.6 million in E is better, and 28 million in F is way better. But that picture in F is exactly like the picture in A. It's just that there are a lot more dots to make up the picture. But e, the picture is made up of dots. And it's not limited by the pixel size on your CCD so much as by the fact that photons are dots. And they're not wavy in the way that they're detected. OK, well, looking ahead a little bit, we need to know some sizes here so we have a feel for what's going on. Electrons, atoms, and nuclei are about this size. The atom is about 10 to the minus 10 meters across. Uh, that's sort of the smallest one. And then they go up from there. Start with hydrogen and go up the periodic table. The atoms get fatter a little bit as you go up. The nucleus is a whole lot smaller. 10 to the minus 15 meters. It's incredibly small. So if the nucleus were a softball, then the electron cloud would extend out for a couple of kilometers with a peak probability of finding an electron at about a kilometer away. So the nucleus is really tiny. And yet, the nucleus is the place where almost all of the mass of the atom is stored. It's in the protons and neutrons of the nucleus. All right, we will discuss this more later, but this having discussed these things a little bit, you might as well know uh, something else about them. There are two different kinds of wave slash particles. There are bosons and there are fermions. Bosons are like photons. They like to be with each other. Photons of the same energy and wave phase just love to be together and everybody wiggles up and down together. Their phases match. Their energies match. That's what a laser is. Photons just naturally want to do this. It has both wave and particle properties. It doesn't have any mass. And it does not practice social distancing. Everybody tries to get as close as possible. And then there are the electrons. And I might mention protons and neutrons as well. They're called fermions. And they don't share quantum states with other electrons. There will never be an electron laser. Electrons don't clump. And the periodic table exists because electrons practice social distancing. But they, just like photons, though, they also behave both as waves and as particles. But unlike photons, they have mass. And we'll do this in a lot more detail later. OK, so let's do an example. What is the energy in electron volts of a visible photon, 500 nanometer wavelength? All right, first step is to write down the, the uh, Planck-Einstein energy relation. The energy of a photon is equal to Planck's constant times its frequency, which is h times c over lambda. You just put numbers in, and it winds up being 3.96 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. 10 to the minus 19 is not a happy number. So we convert to electron volts by dividing that number by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules per EV, the conversion factor, and it ends up being 2.5 EV. That's an energy that's uh, about right for making chemical reactions take place. 
chemical reactions are a few EV in energy. And so when you go out in the sun and these photons come down and beat on your skin, they cause chemical reactions to take place in your skin. And that gives you either a tan or maybe a sunburn. Um, the higher the frequency of the photon, the more intense the chemical reactions are. And that's why at high altitude where there's more ultraviolet light hasn't been filtered out as much by the air. Uh, you can get a really bad sunburn. I got a really bad one at uh, Lake Tahoe once, and I've had bad sunburns on the top of Mount Timpanogos as well. Okay, here's another example. What is the energy of a 60 hertz photon produced by a high voltage power line? Some of you have seen these lines. I have one that goes down a street in my neighborhood. My neighbors are all concerned. Let's figure out what the energy of this photon is. So we do the same thing. HF, don't have to do the C over lambda thing because we have the frequency given to us. Put 60 hertz in there and it's 3.96 times 10 to the minus 32 joules. Converted to EV, this turns out to be about a couple of 10 to the minus 13 EVs. 10 to the minus 13. This is not anywhere near the order of the energies involved in any chemistry in the universe. Certainly not in the human body. Power lines do not emit dangerous radiation. The photons that come out of power lines are so wimpy, they can't do anything at all to your body. And many studies have been made and it always comes out the same. Power lines don't cause anything to happen to the human body. Uh, you might be interested in this one. What is the energy of a photon produced by a cell phone with a carrier frequency of 1.5 gigahertz? That's about, about right. They're mostly between uh, 1 and 2 gigahertz in frequency. So we do the same thing. Figure that one out. It winds up being 0 0.000006 EV. Well, that's also too small too much smaller than chemical energies. Not as ridiculous as power lines, but still pretty ridiculous. And there's no consistent evidence that cell phone radiation has biological effects. You can find studies that find small effects and people get all excited about this, but it's crazy. Um, it's the photons just don't have enough energy to make anything chemical happen. When you go to the dentist, if you look in detail at the x-ray equipment, read the labels on the back. I bug the dental hygienist sometimes when I go in there. I want to look at their electron gun. Uh, typical dental x-ray electron energy is about 200 uh, keV, 200 kilo electron volts. What is the wavelength of that thing? Well, this is a kinetic energy, this 200 keV. So we use the relativistic uh, kinetic energy formula, gamma minus one times mc squared is equal to two times 10 to the five EV. It's handy to use energy units for the mc squared of the electron because that's 0.511 times 10 to the six EV. And then the units conveniently cancel and it's easy to get at gamma. So gamma turns out to be one plus 0.2 over 0.511, it's about 1.4. Once we have the gamma, then we can find the electron speed <coughs> by solving the gamma equals 1.4 equation for, uh, for V. And it turns out to be 2.1 times 10 to the eight meters per second. Getting up there, pretty close to the speed of light. Now we use momentum is equal to gamma MV, the relativistic momentum equation, the de Broglie relation, that's equal to h over lambda, to find that lambda is h over gamma mv. You put the numbers in, and it's about 2.5 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. 10 to the minus 12 with the 2.5 out front. Light has like 500 with the 10 to the minus 9 out front. Much, much longer wavelengths uh, for light than for electrons. Now, having said that, dental x-rays are not images. 
all they do is make a shadow of of your teeth and, the, and your bones they're not actually images what is the frequency of a proton at rest sounds crazy at first but and it is kind of crazy because it's really dumb because the frequency is really high we don't really have any way of using this frequency but still as a reminder that it's the total relativistic energy that goes into the quantum mechanical frequency formula here's how it works out the frequency is e over h you take 938 mega electron volts that's the mc squared of a proton in ev use the conversion factor 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 to convert it to joules divide by 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 the si value of Planck's constant and you get a frequency of 2 times 10 to the 23 Hertz which is just insane uh, would be nice if we had computers that ran that fast but uh, we don't and we almost certainly will never have uh, technology that runs at that frequency okay so here's some questions for next time I'll let you look at these and we are finished for today. I'll see you next time.